if that means we got their stamp of approval, I'll take it. <laughs> and just so you know, Maddie, um, so Ryan will start the the recording, the live stream, um, and then I'll probably just kind of stand here for like 15 seconds and not really say anything. Um, yep. And then once it it kind of kicks through, Ryan just said, go ahead last time. And then I kind of knew to, to get things started. So um, you might kind of see me just standing there, not doing anything for a while, but. Well, you'll be doing delay. better than me. I was moderating on Monday and I was watching the Zoom participant count completely just like blanking on event Moby. So I just sat there and waited. So I was like, no one's in the call. And then realized of course that I can't see the participants. So we should start. All right, we're, we're live guys. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, session on aquatic plant management. My name is Michelle Nault. I'm the statewide lakes and reservoir ecologist for the Wisconsin DNR, and I will be the moderator this morning. I would like to thank our sponsor for this session, Wisconsin Lake and Pond Resource. And I would also like to thank our speaker. Um, we have Maddie Johansson today. Maddie is the statewide aquatic plant management coordinator with the Wisconsin DNR. And she is going to give us an update on our aquatic plant management rule revision updates. Um, if you do have questions during today's presentation, um, please use the Q&A uh, feature on your event Moby platform. Do not use the chat feature. Um, we won't see those come through, but please use the Q&A. Uh, you can also upvote questions um, if you uh, like a question that you see and feel free to type in questions throughout the presentation. We'll read those off at the end. Uh, we should have plenty of time here. We have over an hour to um, talk about this topic. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Maddie. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, before I get started, I want to apologize to everyone. My uh, video camera with my internet streaming today uh, is not working very well. So it was either give you the presentation or be able to show my face. So I will not have my camera on uh, and I apologize for that. Uh, as Michelle said, my name is Maddie Johansson and I am responsible for managing the aquatic plant management program, as well as the rule development process. So today we'll be going through a few things. Um, first off, sort of a rule revision 101, a who, what, when, where, and why of administrative rules. And then I'll get into a brief background on the aquatic plant management program. And then I will get into the policy proposals the program is putting forward for the rule revision, just the high level, you know, high picture aspects of the rule. And then finally, I'll end with discussing how you all can get involved in the process and where you can go to get more information. And then we should have plenty of time for questions at the end. So aquatic plant management laws in Wisconsin, how, um, the law works in the state is the legislature writes state statutes, and these are sort of the general laws of the state that provide direction and clarity to the executive branch programs, one of those being the Department of Natural Resources, to, um, you know, administer the laws of the state. So administrative rules are written by the respective agencies using the authority granted from state statute. And these administrative rules have the effect of law. And um, they're really the department's um, way of implementing and interpreting that statute to provide more specifics and to correctly administer a program. The aquatic plant management program is operating under NR 107 and NR 109. NR-107 is in regards to herbicide management, and NR-109 is in regards to mechanical, physical, mechanical, and biological controls. So 
So because administrative rules are sort of under the umbrella of state statutes, there is quite a lengthy process to change those rules. It can take up to 30 months to go through the entire process. There are approximately six phases in the rule development process with about 11 major steps embedded in there. Currently, the aquatic plant management program is in phase two rule development. Uh, that phase is approximately 12 to 16 months total. Our scope statement, which is phase one, was approved last May. And we anticipate that we will be um, moving forward with a draft of the rule and onto phase three sometime this summer. And I will get into more specifics on that later. If you want to learn more about the administrative rule process, uh, there's a lot of great resources on the DNR's website if you want to do a deep dive. You can simply Google search Wisconsin DNR proposed rules, and that web page will pull up that I have listed below. I can pause for a second if folks want to take a minute and write that down. All right. So the aquatic plant management program's purpose is one to recognize that balanced aquatic plant communities are vital for healthy aquatic ecosystems. And because the department and the state recognize the necessity of aquatic plant communities, it is important that we regulate how and when the management of aquatic plants and other organisms occurs. So that's the primary purpose of the program. The goal is to avoid then minimize harm to the plant community and ecosystem. Management alternatives that I've mentioned previously are chemical, mechanical, manual, biological, and physical controls. This is a uh, map of the 2019 permits. Uh, it's broken down by the different permit types that we categorize. Permits come into us as either chemical private or non-private permits. Now, when I say private permit, I usually am referring to private ponds. And non-private permits are traditionally lakes or small water bodies like ponds that either have public public access or surface water discharge or multiple owners. And then there are mechanical permits, which are split here between green and orange. I wouldn't worry about the difference between the green and orange, just know that the green and orange together are all of the mechanical harvesting permits. As you can see, a lot of the management in the state is pretty heavily focused in the southeast and east part of the state. Um, this sort of tracks with urban development and the larger cities in the state. And as you can see, private ponds are a very large part of the program. Approximately 60% of the permits we receive are for private ponds. Give folks another minute to look this over. I should also say that we sort of have noticed a trend of increasing permits year by year. So the number of permits the department receives tends to go up on an annual basis. So what drives aquatic plant management? There are social and ecological factors uh, that primarily drive it. Historically, the program was created to manage nuisance aquatic plants. Now the challenge with nuisance aquatic plants is that Nuisance is a very subjective term, and it greatly depends on who you're talking to, what lake you're on. Um, you know, one person's nuisance is another person's beautiful mix of aquatic plants, uh, right? So it's, it's one of the big ongoing challenges of the program is how we talk about what scenarios management should occur. Um, now, in addition to managing nuisance aquatic plants, there are also aquatic invasive species. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with aquatic invasive species. They drive a large majority of lake management in the state these days. Um, and that adds another dynamic 
to the management decisions and the permits that we see, um, particularly for AIS population control. Because if you're trying to manage a population of aquatic invasive species, that can change your goals of management over time. It can add complexity to the management options that you could choose, and it can change the reasons for management as well. If you want more information on our program overall, or uh, how we make decisions, or about the permitting process, or just general background information, our website has a lot of information. Uh, to get there, you can Google search Wisconsin DNR APM research, or you can go to this web page that I have listed. Some of the resources we have on there are the strategic analysis of the APM program. That was a large effort done in the last five years that helped frame the administrative rule revision I'll be talking about in a little bit. It is quite a lengthy document, but you can easily use the table of contents to get to chapters that you're interested in. It covers everything from the history of the program to the direction the program wishes to go to all of the most up-to-date research and science that the DNR has available on aquatic plant management. It's all in that document. We also on the website have a lot of technical research documents. We have fact sheets on herbicides, management techniques, and other research. We also have some up-to-date articles. The department has put out articles in various um, medias over the years, and those are also all available on our website. All right. So now I'm going to get into the rule development itself. As I said, we are in the rule development phase, which is approximately one year long. The overall goal of the rule development and why the APM program is proposing changing our administrative rules is to ensure that our program processes and structures are simplified when appropriate. So in this vein, we are proposing to merge our two administrative rules, NR107 and NR109, we would like to write one administrative rule that addresses all aquatic plant management. We'd also like to adhere to current scientific understandings and best management practices. Um, NR107, which relates to the chemical management, was written in 1989. And as you can imagine, you know, we've come a long way in our understandings of herbicides since then. We've, um, our best management practices have changed. The science has moved and we feel it's important and appropriate to ensure that our administrative rules reflect both current law and current scientific understandings. So that's really the main driver behind this rule revision process. To because the program is so complex and there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of various stakeholder interests, we decided to first, um, before we put out a draft of the administrative rule, we decided to write white papers on a subset of topics we felt it would be important to discuss. Each white paper has a background section that is sort of a findings of fact, if you will. And then below that findings of fact, we list out our proposed policies for the new rule. Um, the topics are listed here. We went through permit processing, monitoring and evaluation, treatment scale and timing, aquatic habitat protection, introduced species, planning, harvesting, emergent species management, which when I say emergent species management, I mean wetland management specifically. Emergent species is referring to plants that are coming up from the ground instead of plants that are below the water. So submerged aquatic plants would be the traditional aquatic plants we think of. Emergent species would be those in a wetland environment, as an example. And then finally, private ponds. All of these white papers are on our website to review and read through. Again, you can Google search Wisconsin DNR APM rules, or you can go to this web page. The Google search will get you to that web page, I should say. I'll give you a second to write that down. We had public meetings on these white papers last November, 
and we received public comments through January on these white papers. And um, I'll get more about that process in a little bit. So now I'm gonna go through the big highlights and takeaways from our proposed rule changes. Um, as I said, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. So if you want me to provide more details on any of these, please use the Q&A to ask those questions or to provide comments. For permit processing and review, the biggest change we're proposing is um, the permit issuance timelines. Currently, permits are issued within 10 to 15 business days. Um, however, we've learned as we've worked with the program a long time that <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me, I had something in my throat. Um, we've learned over time that uh, some of the more complex permits and permits that require more consultation or information provided by the stakeholders just take longer than 10 to 15 business days. So the department is proposing to extend permit review times for large scale treatments to 30 days, for permits in wild rice waters up to 45 days, and all other permits maintain that 15 day window. Additionally, um, with permit issuance, currently chemical permits are issued annually and mechanical permits are issued, can be issued up to five years with a permit. The department is proposing that chemical pond permits specifically could be issued for five years and that chemical permits for lakes and wetlands still be issued annually. However, we may consider extensions of that annual permit in some instances. Um, those instances uh, the department is still in the rule drafting process and we haven't determined specifically what scenarios might allow for a multi-year permit. Um, if you have thoughts on that, you are welcome to provide comments. Additionally, um, mechanical permits, we will not change the um, previous, uh, the way the rule is written now where they can be issued for up to five years with the plan that will stay the same. One of the biggest changes we're proposing with the program is monitoring requirements. Currently, monitoring is not a regulatory requirement for the APM program. However, you know, this is part of that bringing our scientific understandings into the fold of the rule. Without monitoring, it's very difficult to determine whether one, the management that's being done is meeting the goals of management in the first place. So understanding the efficacy of treatments. Monitoring also allows us to understand how plant communities are changing over time. And additionally, if the management is harming non-target species, so species that weren't the specific target of management. Um, so the department is proposing a lakewide point intercept survey every five years for all lakes that are being managed. This is just to give us a long-term high level snapshot of our state water bodies so we can understand how the resource is being protected over time. We are also proposing pre and post point intercept surveys for large scale treatments. Again, the reason we're proposing more scrutiny on these large scale treatments is because uh, they are most likely to have whole lake impacts. And if a treatment is going to impact an entire ecosystem, the department feels it's important that we understand what's happening as a result of that management so we can inform future decision making. Now I mentioned, I've mentioned large scale management a few times and I wanna briefly talk about how we're proposing to change large scale management definitions. Currently, if a chemical treatment is over 10 acres in size or over 10% of the littoral zone that is less than, that is 10 feet or less in depth, 
in that scenario, public notice is required for the permit, as well as a large scale worksheet that dives more into watershed scale impacts and a few other things. So the department is proposing to change this definition to bring it up to speed with our current understandings of how herbicide movement works in the water body and when we can see whole lake impacts from an herbicide treatment. So if a chemical treatment is to be in an area greater than 5% of the water body, a calculation would be required to determine whether lake treatments will have whole lake impacts. So we're simply proposing that that 5% threshold trigger a calculation with the permit submission. So if that calculation indicates that there will be whole lake impacts from the herbicide treatment, then public notice and monitoring would be required as I mentioned on the previous slide. However, if the calculation indicates that there will not be whole lake impacts from the treatment, then public notice and monitoring would not be required as a result of a large scale treatment. So I wanna be clear that 5% is not a hard threshold like it is currently written in the rule with the 10 acres. It is just a hard threshold currently. We're simply proposing that at 5%, that's when we do the calculation to determine if there will be whole lake impacts or not. On to habitat protections. Currently, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, you know, aquatic plant communities are recognized as vital to the ecosystem. However, in our current administrative rules, there are specific species that are listed as high value. It's quite a few pond weeds and a few other species. Um, and in addition, the department designated sensitive areas have greater protections currently in the rule. So the department is proposing to expand habitat protections with the rule. Um, particularly by removing that specific species list of high value species and instead just simply state that aquatic species and aquatic plants are a part of aquatic habitats and those are vital to a healthy and dynamic ecosystem. Additionally, the department proposes expanding protections beyond just sensitive areas to all department designated protected resource waters. Now there's quite a few different classifications there. I'm not going to get into them today. If you want to learn more about that, I encourage you to go look at the white paper on habitat protections. Um, and the goal of doing this is of course to make sure that our you know, high value resource waters are being protected and are being managed judiciously. Um, another change that specifically to the herbicide um, side of things would be planning and planning requirements. Currently, chemical permit applications do not need a management plan and mechanical permits may need a management plan. So the department is proposing management plans for most management activities. Uh, the department's proposing that these plans be done every five years. Um, this ties back to that monitoring I was discussing of the lakewide PI survey every five years. The lakewide PI would be done as a part of the planning process. Um, so we can use that data and the lake group can use that data to help inform management decisions. Um, the department is creating templates for these plans um, and is also developing ways to pull all of the necessary baseline data needed directly from the department website. Um, the goal of that is to make these plans streamlined and easy to follow and so lake groups with just a little bit of help from the department or with a consultant if they wish are able to write their own management plans. The department is proposing planning for herbicide management as well as mechanical management in order to create continuity of management strategies over time, to encourage ecologically conscious management approaches, and to encourage public participation in management decisions. Now, uh, another fundamental um, piece of the program that exists now, but we're really proposing to formally integrate it, um, is integrated pest management principles. 
For those of you who aren't familiar with IPM, it's an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques. So often when we mention pests in an APM context, we're talking about aquatic invasive species. Not always, but a lot of the times. Um, integrated pest management emphasizes the understanding of the target species, of the pest itself, understanding that species life cycle, its habitat preferences, um, how it interacts in the environment it's in, um, with the goal being if you understand the species and how it interacts in your water body, you're better able to understand the best management approaches to manage that specific species. Integrated pest management is also designed to have pesticides used judiciously. Um, pesticides can be a really sharp tool in our toolbox and it's important to keep that tool sharp by not overusing it and not relying solely on it in all instances. But that's just one aspect of integrated pest management. It isn't the fundamental driver of IPM. And finally, IPM is used to minimize risk to human health, beneficial species, and the ecosystem as a whole. So the department is sort of incorporating integrated pest management decision making into the planning process. And that's how we're proposing to integrate IPM into the aquatic plant management program. Finally, we have emergent species management, um, wetlands specifically, as I mentioned earlier. Currently, our administrative rules are written really for in water body management. They're written for lake and pond management. Um, and while we regulate wetland management, the, it's kind of a square peg round hole. The way the rule is written now is how I would describe it. So the department is proposing to create a section of the rule specific to terrestrial wetland management. Um, there's a lot of pieces here that we still need to figure out. Um, if you read through the white paper on emergent species management, you'll learn pretty quickly that there's a lot of aspects of this section of the rule that are still a work in progress. And if there are any of you on this call today who, you know, either do this management as a practitioner or are interested, you know, I encourage you to read through our white paper and reach out and provide comments or input when a first draft of the rule comes out to help us write the section of a rule in a way that makes sense. Finally, ponds. So currently in most instances, mechanical management is waived from permitting for pond scenarios. Not always, but in most instances. And for chemical management, ponds are an annual permit the definition of a private pond currently is the water body is owned by one owner with no surface water discharge or connection to waters of the state and no public access. And if it meets those criteria, the pond is exempt from public notice requirements. Um, but the department is proposing changing the pond classification due to urbanization and the development of stormwater runoff development and uh, stormwater ponds, excuse me, as well as a few other scenarios, the department proposes we update ponds classifications to have three or four different definitions of ponds, um, particularly stormwater ponds, public ponds, and farm ponds. Um, with the goal being we can actually identify the specific types of ponds and provide the correct um, or the most appropriate amount of regulatory scrutiny for those specific scenarios. The department is also proposing a five-year permit for all ponds as we classify them in order to streamline that permitting process. So I just threw a lot of information at you and um, you may be wondering how you can learn more or get involved in the rule development process. Uh, the first step for you would be to sign up for APM rule updates, the Gov delivery. Um, to get to it, you can Google search Wisconsin DNR Gov delivery, or you can go to this webpage below, 
once you get there and you enter in your phone number or your email address, it gives you a page with a whole host of gov delivery options. The department has a, you know, many, many, many gov delivery listservs that you can sign up for. To sign up for the aquatic plant management rule updates, you would go down to the water section and at the very bottom is the aquatic plant management rule updates and you would select that one. We use the gov delivery to let folks know of upcoming public comment opportunities, public meetings, or information, new information for the public to review as it relates to the rule development. So um, in addition to the gov delivery, you can also check the website. Um, you can Google search Wisconsin DNR APM rules and read through all of the white papers that I showed you earlier. Um, as I said, they provide a really high level, uh, high level overview of what the department is envisioning and proposing with the new rule. Um, and to continue being involved, if you've signed up for Gov Delivery and you're frequently checking the website, you can attend public meetings and provide written comments at different points in the process. I can also say, I should say now that during the Q&A session, I'm happy to pull up a screen and show you where to find all of these things on the web page. I might go ahead and do that once I finish going through this information, um, if in case that's helpful for folks. So here's an updated timeline of where we are in the rule development process. As I said, we had public meetings on the white papers last fall, and our comment deadline for those was January 15th. Um, so this spring, we are, the department is reviewing and considering all of the public comments we received and using the comments to help inform a first draft of the new administrative rule. We will also be having a public meeting on public notification and public meeting requirements that will be coming up in the next month or so. Um, I didn't actually discuss public meeting requirements here yet because we haven't had a public meeting on it. If you are familiar with our current process, uh, which is newspaper notification uh, for large scale treatments, if you have opinions on that or thoughts or questions, I encourage you to attend the upcoming public meeting. A specific date has not been set yet, but if you sign up for the Gov Delivery, you'll know as soon as we do of when that meeting will be. We will also have a meeting to go over the first draft of the new NR 107 for review. This summer, we will have our economic impact analysis section of the rule. This is another opportunity for you all to provide comments on how the rule may have economic implications. And then finally, uh, next winter, you know, a little under a year from now, we will have our final public hearing on the draft of the rule before we move on to the other steps in the process. Um, and that's sort of the last big opportunity for you all to provide comments on the final draft of the rule. So that's sort of the timeline we're in now. Um, are there any questions or actually first I'm going to do this. I'm going to show my screen here as I, I referenced a lot of Google search options for you. I'll just show you some of them now. So if you just go Wisconsin DNR, here we go. It, I've already searched this, but aquatic plants research. The first one to pop up is this one. And this has a lot of the information. Now I have to admit, and this is a tip for you all, if you didn't know, the department currently has two different versions of the website that are visible to the public. So dnr.wi.gov is the old version of the website and dnr.wisconsin.gov is the new version of the website. So I would encourage you to go to the new version. And then of course, this can happen. This is why I'm going through this because we're having a bit of a, it can be confusing for folks because it pulls up two different versions of the website. Uh, 
as you can see, there's quite a few different options here. This one does take you to it. Um, so this is the Aquatic Plant Management Rules webpage. As you can see, we have a list of all of the administrative rules as well as other related administrative rules. Um, all of the white papers are here as well as meeting recordings of those original public meetings. They're just about two hours or over long. So just be aware of that. Um, and then the updated timeline here. From the main APM webpage, you can also get background information on aquatic plants here. You can get information on herbicide fact sheets. On the information tools and research. This is where I referenced all of that background information you can find, specifically the strategic analysis, as well as all of the various articles and other research that are available. Now, this isn't everything the department has, of course, it is just a simple, you know, the high level pieces. The strategic, strategic analysis really has quite a few resources for you. So those are the web pages. I'm gonna try this one more time. I wonder if I do Ah, so if you actually type out the word Wisconsin, it'll pull up the new website instead of the old version of the website. It's the same information on both versions. However, the new version is more updated. So I, I just want to emphasize that it's the Wisconsin.gov, not the WI.gov. All right. So I think we have time for questions now. All right, thank you very much, Maddie. Um, appreciate you giving us a uh, update on um, the aquatic plant management rule revision. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. So um, again, if you do have questions for Maddie, please type them into the, the Q&A portion of the, uh, the event Moby platform. Uh, you can also upvote questions if you see ones that uh, you would also like answered. So the first one um, is about uh, spot treatment. So uh, during a spot treatment, a permit is issued for specific locations. And while the contractor is out doing the treatment, uh, new spots might be noted. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how the new rule might accommodate a 5% permit increase uh, during treatment in the new regulations. Um, they're looking to kind of close a oversight. Uh, so specifically, if you're, you know, they're out on the boat and the new spot comes up, will the new rule allow for folks to change the treatment areas? Is that what they're getting at here? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, they get permitted for a certain acreage and then when they're out there, maybe they notice some additional areas. So how will the new rule I guess, you know, accommodate that um, with the 5% uh, idea in mind. Ah, so if if they were going to increase it so that it would bump over the 5% threshold. Yes, I, I believe that's the question. Okay, well, that's a good question and I do not have an answer offhand. That's probably something we should think about. Um, you know, I would think that if you know this water body scenario had a management plan, most likely that management plan would highlight all of the potential areas where management would occur or could occur, as well as where um, what the different management options are available for those specific areas on the water body. So I think one of the benefits of having management plans that provide all of our options is it can allow us to have a little bit more flexibility on that annual basis if 
specific water body conditions do change. Um, so again, if you're, you know, proposing a treatment that's close to that 5% threshold, it's probably going to be a good idea to just, you know, do that calculation to make sure that what you're doing isn't going to um, accrue whole lake impacts and biologists will be able to work with folks on that. Um, so I don't think we'll have something specific in the rule for that scenario, but it is a good question. It is something we should think about more. So thank you. I think you're muted, Michelle. Sorry, I was definitely on mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, again, this uh, another question that came in was um, regarding whole lake treatments. And um, if there are some sensitive areas identified out on a lake, can a whole lake treatment be used as a tool or not? Ooh, that's a good question. I would imagine that it would depend greatly again on the specific water body and um, whether that management approach was appropriate. All management decisions have a cost benefit analysis with them. So is the impact of the species you're targeting or the reason you're you know, managing the species in the first place, is the impact of that great enough that the impacts of a whole lake treatment, as an example, are lesser than the impact of the species itself. And weighing that cost benefit, which isn't always clear cut, but having those conversations with your management plan. If there are sensitive areas in your water body, uh, you know, as we're planning to expand those protections, it's going to be very important that the permittee would have to show in their management plan, as well as in their permit, how they were going to avoid and then minimize impacts to the resource. Um, and if, you know, to be frank, there was a scenario where uh, that whole lake treatment was going to have, you know, a lot of impacts to the resource in a way that would be harmful, then maybe that permit wouldn't be approved. But if there was another scenario, depending on the type of management or the specific herbicide or whatever the scenario might be, uh, it could be possible with a management plan, if that was incorporated, it could be allowed. I keep emphasizing and going back to the management plans because I think a lot of the questions you're bringing up are issues that would be addressed with that overarching management strategy versus the annual permit is just implementing your plan on a year to year basis. Okay, uh, great. Uh, we have a question about um, how the proposed rule changes uh, might align with some of the recent changes to the surface water grant program. I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Hmm. Well, one of the goals with the rule revision is to make sure that the surface water grant program and the APM program are aligned with one another. Um, and so that planning requirements or monitoring requirements or all of those pieces could be nested within one another. Um, without a specific piece, it's hard for me to answer that question. If there's a specific part of the surface water grants program that you're curious about, we could dive into that further. Um, but all I can say broadly is that yes, we will be making sure that the two programs work well together. Okay, um, we have a question here about um, uh, private ponds. So in, in the county that this person is in, they have several developments where they have ponds of one or two acres large. It's part of the plot. It's not necessarily a farm, a farm but it's a residential subdivision. And they're wondering how these might be classified um, in, our, in our proposed pond classification. That's a good question. I can't answer that specifically without looking at the ponds themselves, but it sounds like those are still most likely stormwater ponds that were developed when that residential area was built. Um, if, if the ponds were built as stormwater retention or for runoff control as part of the residential area, those would most likely be classified in that stormwater ponds category. If it's a natural pond that already existed there, um, 
again, it would probably either be in the farm pond category or the stormwater pond category. Um, it, you know, it, it really, the department's focus on the ponds is, you know, does that water body have discharge to other waters of the state? And, you know, are there, can members of the public just use that resource or is it more of an exclusive ownership of a small water body? Okay, um, another question, um, again, re referring to pond. Um, and so what, what differences in regulations does the proposed rule have for a, a private stormwater versus a private farm versus the private residential pond? The regulations between those would most likely be the same with the exception of perhaps, um, and this is something we're still considering and seeking comments on is what specific scenarios with um, water discharge should public notice be required. So I think all of those scenarios were still considering the five-year permit um, and a lot of the mechanics of it wouldn't be much different from how those pond permits are done now, except for they'd be done every five years instead of annually. Um, it's really just that public notice piece and when members of the public um, should be informed of those treatments. Okay, uh, there was another comment here that uh, they didn't really see information about the pond classification in the white papers. And, um, you know, perhaps that's something that uh, needs to get expanded upon a little bit. And um, I guess if folks have comments, definitely send those over to Maddie. Um, another question here about um, other management techniques such as harvesting, mechanical harvesting, um, dash, uh, hand removal, um, whether or not the department's looking at the judicial use of those as well. Uh, yes, of course. I think one of the important components of integrated pest management, particularly in relation to aquatic invasive species management, is you know looking at the specific characteristics of the water body and how that aquatic invasive species or whatever target species it is, is interacting both with other aquatic plants in the water body and the water body as a whole and with water body users. And then, you know, through your management plan, highlighting all of the available management options that could work for that scenario. And then it would be up to the lake groups and the biologists, along with our consultants or applicators, to look at all of those options and weigh the pros and cons of each of them. Okay, um, we have a question here about uh, using the kind of 5% threshold for calculations and um, you know, who and how will it be determined if an herbicide treatment uh, will have or might have whole lake impacts? Um, it would be a part of the permit process. So again, I think with the management plans, you know, lake groups are most likely to think through the scenarios where would have already thought through the scenarios when a whole lake treatment would be required. Um, and, you know, so a lot of times that's fairly cut and dried of we're going to do a whole lake treatment. So we'll just do the calculation to get the whole lake concentration rate. Um, but that 5% is to capture those treatments that may be weren't intended to be a whole lake treatment, but due to the herbicide and the water body might have whole lake impacts. And so that calculation would be a part of the permit process. So the permittee would, if they're hitting that 5% threshold, do the calculation and submit that as part of the permit to the department. Okay. Um a question about uh, the future kind of cost benefit analysis procedure that the department intends to use and whether or not this will determine if an action is uh, adequately available to the public. Mm, can we rephrase that question? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, I, 
I think, you know, I, I know the department will do a cost benefit analysis as part of the rule revision. That's a, a requirement. Um, I'm assuming adequate means adequately available to the public. So determine if an action, so maybe uh, a specific management action or maybe a, a monitoring uh, requirement is, you know, are there resources out there um, to, to do that? I guess um, the person if that asked this can definitely uh, rephrase the question and retype it in as well. Right. So if, if you're talking about cost benefit analysis of of the rule revision, that's wrapped up in the economic impact analysis and how the um, new proposed rule may impact uh, both small businesses and Wisconsin's economy. Um, and so that will be occurring over the summer. If you're talking about cost benefit analysis of management decisions, you know, there isn't going to be anything written specifically into the rule in regards to that that isn't already in existing administrative rule. Okay. Uh... Another question here about um, clarification on mechanical pulling through the rule update. Um, they're seeing some more manufacturers making harvesting harvesters that uh, physically pull plants out of the water rather than cut them. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, those are on the department's radar right now. Uh, as of now, there aren't any plans to address those specifically in the administrative rule process, but I will say that the department during our normal program operations is currently evaluating um, that specific technology and its uses in the state. Okay, uh, we got uh, three more questions here. Um, there's one regarding whole lake PI surveys. Um, so the surface water grant program seems to want to fund uh, more along the lines of the 10 year time frame, but the proposed APM rule change recommendation is looking to require a five year PI survey. I'm wondering if you could speak to that at all. Um, are the PIs every five year, 10 years, Michelle, with the grant program? I, I don't believe they are. I believe that the, the, at least under the new surface water grant program, that uh, a point intercept aquatic plant survey is a, an every five year requirement. Um, we can, we can check in with our surface water grant uh, program coordinator on that one, but I believe the idea there was to marry up the right. surface water grant program with our APM rule revision um, with a, a five year um, in both programs. So, right. Um, Okay, uh, this is, uh, I guess, some more of a, a comment. Um, appreciate the efforts to minimize the cost of developing a management plan. Um, not all lake groups can afford the current costs. At the same time, they do wanna do some management of AIS. Um, so, uh, you know, I definitely think developing a plan makes groups eligible for surface water grant programs, which can help actually fund some of the boots on the ground work for AIS control. So good comment there. Um, uh, okay, and then one final question or uh, maybe one more rephrased. Uh, what is the department's stance on public notice requirements for the rule revision? We will be having a public meeting on that in the next month or two. Um, and we will, in that public meeting, we will uh, provide a few different policy alternatives and receive comments on those and use that um, comment time to inform what we end up putting in the rule. So hang tight, sign up for the Gov delivery and you'll hear more about that in the upcoming weeks. Okay, and I actually saw that um, Ryan posted uh, a message here in a, a chat. So, um, uh, so the question is, I assume the management plan required refers to just APM what comprehensive understanding slash planning, i.e. NR193, may be required for an appropriate aquatic plant management plan? Um, That's a good question. I, you know, we're working with the surface water grants program to ensure that um, 
you know, any plan written through the surface water grant program could be considered eligible as an aquatic plant management plan as part of our permitting process. And going back the other way, um, you know, an aquatic plant management plan written by the APM program in some instances could be considered eligible or provide eligibility for management dollars on the surface water grant side. There might be a few discrepancies there because the surface water grants program may have more information that they require than we will in our plans, if that makes sense, but there would be funding sources available to expand that plan if you needed to, say if you were trying to go from a simple aquatic plant management plan to a comprehensive management plan as one example. Um, but yes, we are doing everything we can to make sure that the two programs work well together and so that folks don't have to duplicate efforts. Okay, uh, great. And then a question about the calculations for uh, potential whole lake impacts. Um, this person is wondering whether or not uh, temperature profiles or updated uh, bathymetry depth maps might be required. Yeah, bathymetry would certainly play a role in that as well as most up-to-date stratification information. Um, again, you know, our goal is to have those resources available on the department web pages for folks. So um, there could be a few scenarios where some of that data might need to go be acquired, but the most up-to-date information in most cases should be available from the department. Okay, uh, quick question here on, um, can you just remind us what the remaining timeline is for engagement in the rural revision process? Certainly, let's go back. Oop, went the wrong way. Aha, so as I said, uh, we will be having two public meetings this spring, one on public notification and public meeting requirements and a meeting, which I would say would be more of a information session on a first draft of the rule where we'll just go over the draft of the rule and then we'll provide time for folks to provide comments on that draft. After that, we will move on into the economic impact analysis. The department will write the economic impact analysis and then the public is able to comment on that economic impact analysis report. And then finally, there will be a public hearing where we will formally go over sort of the last draft of the rule. And that will be the last opportunity for folks to provide input. So there are at least three or four opportunities over the next calendar year where you can be as involved as you would like to be. Um, and all that information again will be provided on Gov Delivery with updates, as well as on that APM rules website that I showed you, which is this web page. Um, and as I said, I am managing this rule development process. So, you know, comments, questions can be funneled directly to me and I can um, help answer them for you. So if you have, you know, we're about out of time here, but if you have specific questions or you wanna talk about this more, I'm happy to set up a time to do that. Um, and there is my contact information. Great. Um, I see uh, one more question here about the timeline and requirements for whole lake surveys are not listed in NR 193 for grants. Where can they be found? Um, I believe those can be found in the surface water grant guidance document. So if you go to our DNR website uh, and go to our surface water grant page, there's an associated uh, PDF document that lays out um, some more specific guidance for our surface water grant program, um, including um, different monitoring requirements, uh, department approved protocols, some of our cost containment information. Um, yep, and I see Maddie's navigating it uh, there right now. So um, it's, a, it's a great resource to look into if you're considering um, looking into the surface water grant program to perhaps help fund some of the aquatic invasive species control activities for your water body. Um, and then last minute here, um, we had the question earlier somewhat rephrased and sent back in. Um, so it was stated that we're gonna, uh, the department will do a cost benefit analysis 
uh, to determine if a management decision is appropriate for the water body. And they're wondering whether or not the cost benefit analysis procedure will be made available to the public. Ah, the, well, the cost benefit procedure is really on the permittee, not on the department. And that's a part of the planning process itself. So that integrated pest management decision making is going through that cost benefit analysis and that's tied up in the planning process. So that will be the, the procedure, I would say, is the planning process itself. Okay, great. Well, that puts us at 11 o'clock right on the dot. So thank you very much, Maddie, for um, giving us an update on the aquatic plant management rule revision. Um, if folks have further questions, uh, feel free to reach out to her. Um, and uh, thank you again and enjoy the rest of the conference today. Take care.